Hello, welcome back. We're working on our universal moral principles. And today we want to talk about the universal principle of human dignity. Remember, we're trying to establish a moral law based on these universal principles. And we're looking at how these principles are rooted in human nature. All right, remember on lack, origin, nature, law, application, consequence, the way we're organizing each of these moral laws. All right, so let's talk about human dignity. This is going to uh, help us to recall some of the things we've talked about previously. Um, tell me if you think we could make this into a universal. We're born human. That seems like a universal, right? We're born human. Human dignity distinguishes us from animals. So we treat human beings different than animals. Not everybody thinks we should, but we'd need rational justification for, for not treating humans and animals differently. Now, why do we treat them differently? It's because of the nature of this law. So let's go to the next point. Human dignity consists in the capacity to understand. We have the capacity to understand. Remember we talked about reason is used to form concepts, judgments, and arguments, the forms of all thought. We've also talked about how we use reason to grasp meaning, and we go from meaning to truth, truth to knowledge, knowledge to understanding, and then hopefully on to wisdom. So we have this capacity to understand. Now, we don't always exercise that capacity and we don't exercise it equally amongst ourselves. So that's where the law is going to come in. But let's review this. Human dignity consists in the capacity to understand. We understand by means of reason. And just to help you recall, reason in humans is natural. Remember, it's not cultural, it's not conventional, it's universal the same in all people at all times. And human society is a society of rational beings. Remember, we're political animals as well. So political means we live in society. So we live together. Participation in or separation from human society depends on the exercise of our capacity to understand. So notice there's a distinction being made between the capacity to understand and the exercise of that capacity. So there are instances in which we don't exercise our capacity to understand as much as we can. Think of children. Children are still developing their, their exercise of the capacity to understand and so they need help. And so they are restricted. Children's freedom is restricted because they haven't reached that level of the age of reason or a certain level of maturity that brings responsibility. Think of our friends. Um, sometimes our friends do things that seem uh, unreasonable to us. We often restrict their access to us. We'll call this a kind of social prison. Um, and then think of criminals who are not exercising their capacity to understand, possibly denying other people's dignity. We restrict them by putting them in jail or prison. So we do have an exercise of this law, even if informally, we restrict the freedom of those who are not exercising their capacity to understand. Children, colleagues, criminals, friends. All right, so participation in or separation from human society depends on the exercise of this capacity. The more we understand, the more we show we are rational, the more responsible we are, the more freedom we have. So sometimes we talk about with freedom comes responsibility. I think that's because we're rational and we ought to be using our reason. Now here's the law for this one. It has to do with human dignity. We are to affirm human dignity. We are to treat others as having the capacity and the responsibility for understanding. So 
if we're going to treat human beings with dignity, then we should treat them as if they are capable of reason and responsible for the use of reason, which is something we don't seem to do a lot of these days. We are not really willing to hold people accountable for their being unreasonable or not using reason. And I think it's because of this age of skepticism that we live in. If we really can't know, then we really can't hold people accountable. But what if we really can know and we ought to be holding people accountable? We ought to be holding skeptics accountable, including ourselves, if we're being skeptical. I mean, not skeptical like, hmm, I wonder, but more like we can't know. All right, so we're to affirm human dignity. We're to treat others as having the capacity and responsibility for understanding. This is also going back to the previous moral law about authority. Exercising authority in the use of reason. And part of exercising authority is also seeing to it that those over whom you exercise authority are acting rationally too. You're treating those under you with dignity having the capacity and the responsibility to understand. All right, now we get into the applications of this moral law, and there are many. This is one of those hot-button moral laws. It's going to have a lot of topics, so I should maybe give you a trigger warning or tell you, oh, the topics coming up could be uncomfortable. We're going to talk about some things that are difficult. All right, so the first one is affirmation of human dignity is opposed to the use of force in murder and war. First, the use of force rather than the use of argument. We can't get what we want through discussion, dialogue, argumentation. So we use force to get what we want. And notice the first one is murder. Now it's not saying kill, it says murder. There's a distinction between things like self-defense uh, or accidental death and murder, where murder is the intentional taking of the life of another. Uh, sometimes they say with malice aforethought. So we talk about different levels of murder in our legal system. And I think that's recognizing that not all killing is murder. Murder can be prevented. Um, murder results from accumulated lack of personal discipline in self-control and a false view of the good. So think about cases in which someone murders another person or maybe television shows. There's lots of shows with murder, murder mystery shows. Those are some of my favorites. What's going on though? Usually somebody wants something and it's maybe money, power, uh, another person, and those things aren't the good. And so it starts with a false view of the good lack of rational justification for their view of the good, and uh, a lack of self-control in obtaining it. We don't obtain it through ordinary means. We have to take the life of another to obtain what we want. Um, so murder is wrong, morally wrong, because it is denying the dignity of another human being. Now, war is another application of this moral law. Now, sometimes war is defense. Sometimes it is offense. Uh, some of my books behind me, I don't know if you can see it. There's a book back there, Just War Against Terror. Um, so there are just war theorists and they uh, argue for uh, war as a means of defending the nation. Uh, but look at this uh, application here. It says war results from accumulated collective failure to use reason on both sides. War is usually an es escalation of uh, a crisis of, of disagreement between nations. And what do they think is the good? Why are they going to war? What are they trying to accomplish? Usually it's a power struggle, right? Maybe it's over resources. Maybe it's over money. Maybe it's over uh, power. It's usually power. Let's think about it. So um, when we go to physical war, it's a, it's a sign that there has been a breakdown in dialogue. We haven't been able to reason with one another. 
perhaps we haven't gotten to the basic assumption assumptions over which we really differ. So how do we present, prevent physical war? Look at the handout, intellectual war, which destroys false ideologies, prevents physical war. People are willing to go to war for a cause. What if it's an ideological cause? What if it's a, a falsehood people are going to war for? Well, we should be able to destroy that falsehood before we ever go to war. So think about where wars are in our world right now. Are there ideologies behind them? And can we intellectually destroy the ideology before we physically destroy ourselves by going to physical battle? And it seems as though physical wars have a limitation. We send our young people off, they die, and it seems like a waste, a waste of life. And uh, that should get us to stop and think about our view of the good. Are we wasting lives, uh, denying human dignity for some false view of the good? So war should make us think. It's natural evil. It should get us to stop and think and ask ourselves, are we uh, pursuing a false ideology, a false view of the good, and in so doing, are we denying the dignity of others? Now, again, sometimes self-defense is necessary because some other ideology is encroaching upon a nation physically. All right, let's go to the next application. Affirmation of human dignity is opposed to racism. What is racism? In racism, ethnicity is placed above our common humanity in reason. So remember we talked about our the universal uh, aspect of human nature is that we're rational political animals. That's a universal. And then we have differing presuppositions, basic beliefs, differing personality types, differing backgrounds. Race and ethnicity is part of our background and we elevate our background over our humanity. And then we fight over that fourth level aspect of human nature rather than recognizing our unity in the most basic aspect of human nature where we're first and fundamentally rational. So racism is a reversal of that order. It puts ethnicity and race, which are accidental qualities, above rationality, which is an essential quality of human nature. So racism is dehumanization because we fail to understand what it is to be a human. All right, let's look at the next application. It's, it's very similar. Uh, affirmation of human dignity is opposed to sexism and gender wars. So sexism is where we put that other background factor, sex, uh, above rationality. We put our um, male, female, or whatever gender we have above our rationality, and then we fight over it, and we fight um, ideologically, and uh, it's tension in our culture now. So in gender wars, we fail to understand the nature of male-female differences. In gender wars, we fail to hold each other responsible for the use of reason. All human beings, no matter what gender, are responsible for the use of reason. So we should put that first. And notice there are differences. This is uh, something we maybe don't talk about. Are there gender differences? Can we identify those and not just uh, brush them off, but recognize their importance and celebrate them? All right, uh, the next one's a little bit difficult and maybe we'll get into some arguments over this one. Affirmation of human dignity is opposed to abortion, euthanasia, and suicide, and to intervention that disregards the loss of the capacity to understand. So that's a bunch of different applications, but notice it's about uh, beginning of life and end of life issues. So let's start with the beginning of life issues, abortion. Now, if we were in class, we would have an extended conversation about abortion and the pros that people give reasons for having abortions or supporting 
abortion rights and the cons or the against side. I can give you a few of those. You can think about them. Maybe you want to take out a piece of paper and write down reasons people give for having abortions, reasons people give for being against having abortions. And a lot of times the reasons for are practical or psychological reasons. They're not philosophical reasons. And the reasons against also uh, could be practical, psychological, sometimes religious reasons. But we need to get to the philosophical heart of this dispute. And the heart of the dispute about abortion has to do with uh, personhood and when does a person begin? What is a person? What is human life? When does it begin? Now, this is the philosophical pieces that you should think through in this question of abortion and human dignity. First, humans are rational, political animals. All right, so we have rationality, that's part of our soul. And we have a body, that's part of being an animal. So humans are a body-soul unity. If you don't agree with that, then that's a piece that needs to be hashed out first. Remember, presuppositional thinking, what is a human? If human beings are just a body, then there shouldn't be any question about abortion. It's just a physical uh, uh, mass of cells. Uh, but if humans have a soul, then it's a different question. Um, and so is ethics, though, and rational justification for ethics. So I'm going with the assumption that there is a soul that human beings have. Now, the question is, when does the soul begin? Uh, what is the soul? So the soul is the capacity to understand. It's the self that does the thinking. And the capacity to understand can't be separated from the body. The human being is a body-soul unity. So a human begins, life begins at conception. And I'm willing to argue that. So if you disagree with me, drop me a line and we'll argue. Um, so life Human life is body, soul, unity begins at conception. So the capacity to understand is there from conception. Now I know the capacity can be hindered. Maybe a person has brain damage. Maybe a person uh, has developmental disabilities. Okay, but the capacity is there. It's been hindered physically by some malady or deformation or damage brain damage even. So we need to keep the distinction between the capacity and the exercise of the capacity. The capacity is there from conception. Now in the abortion discussion, um, the philosophical part is that is abortion morally wrong or is it okay morally? This isn't the legal argument, moral argument, remember. Um, so I've been around people who argue about abortion and I've given, I have two uh, different ways that they uh, approach this uh, discussion. We'll talk about the legal and the moral. First, I think we should do the moral case okay, since I'm emphasizing that. Um, it goes like this. Um, if human beings have a soul and the soul is there from conception, the soul also continues forever. Remember we talked about personal immortality? The soul continues, the human continues. And so uh, this is going to be tough to think through. If a human is forever, there's personal immortality, then the fetus also is forever. And I would argue that a human is forever, so the fetus is also forever. So in abortion, we may uh, stop that person's life on earth, but they continue into the future. And it does seem like uh, we've hindered their contribution to the good, to the human project. And it seems as though we will encounter that person again in the future, and they'll ask why. So they'll want to know why was my life terminated before I can contribute to the good. So life has continuity and uh, human life has continuity into the future. 
So we need to consider that in this question, the moral question of abortion. Um, the legal side has to do with the protection of life. So if we protect human life at, let's say, let's say we protect the life of an infant, a two-year-old, a 13-year-old, a 20-year-old, a 70-year-old, and uh, if an infant is human and there's continuity all through that life, we'd also have to go back and say, well, the fetus also is human and it is not separate from an infant, a two-year-old, a 13-year-old, a 20-year-old, a 70-year-old. That person is continuous, both physically, their DNA, and their soul, their personhood. So uh, if, if it's wrong to, to kill an infant, it's like, it's, let's say an infant is human, uh, then it's, it's wrong to kill a human, then a fetus is a human, it's wrong to kill a fetus. So here's an argument. If an infant is human, then a fetus, fetus is human. An infant is human, then a fetus is human. Because there's no distinction between outside the womb and inside the womb. If we think of a person as uh, a body-soul unity, where the body has particular DNA and uh, signature in the cell and uh, a soul that is having the capacity to understand. So that's the same, inside and outside the womb. All right, the, the um, legal side of this then, if an infant is protected legally, then the fetus should be protected legally. Um, an infant is protected legally, so the fetus should be protected legally. Now, some people are wanting to say infanticide is okay. It's okay to, to, uh, to kill a fetus. It's okay to kill a human outside the womb, sorry. Um, I don't know, we're gonna have to give an argument for that. If it's okay to kill an infant outside the womb, for how long and why? What's the rational justification for that? All right, so the philosophical focus of the uh, argument about abortion is on personhood and on the capacity to understand. If it, the capacity is there from conception, then it's there forever. It's the exercise of the capacity that varies. I feel like I should pause here because there are more applications and this video is kind of going long and I want to pause, give you a moment to reflect and uh, maybe come up with objections and then we'll go into some other applications. All right.